Good morning, everyone. I'm Liz Charlotte, Director of Communications at the Mississippi State Department of Health. As always, we thank you for joining us. We know you all have busy days, and but our goal is to get the information out to you as soon as we possibly can. So today, unfortunately, we have a record high number of cases. Yesterday, we had a record high number of deaths. Uh, Dr. Dobbs could not be with us today, so we have our state epidemiologist, Dr. Paul Byers, and our Director of Health Protection and Senior Deputy at the agency, Mr. Jim Craig. So I'm going to first have Dr. Byers talk a little bit about what's going on, and then Mr. Craig will talk about some exciting news about uh, vaccine and vaccine sites coming up next week. So Dr. Byers, would you like to go ahead? Uh, absolutely, and, and good morning, everyone, and thank y'all for joining us. So um, as Liz indicated, we are reporting out um, over 3,000 additional cases today. Um, that's actually 3,023 uh, cases. If, if you look, there, there was a minimal delay in reporting um, over the Christmas holidays, but honestly, guys, we are still seeing a lot of transmission out there, and this represents um, a lot of cases that we're still seeing and are being reported. Um, if you look at today's deaths, we're reporting out an additional 29 deaths, but sadly yesterday, we reported out 85 additional deaths by far the largest number of deaths we've reported out in one day. Um, so we are still seeing a lot of transmission. It is still bad out there right now. Um, and you know we haven't even made it through the holidays yet. So we wanna remind folks that you know we've, we've got some exciting news about, about vaccine that we're gonna continue to talk um, and, uh, about, but we still need folks to wear a mask. We still need you to stay six feet away avoid those large gatherings, stay within your nuclear family, except for those essential functions that you need to go out and do. Um, so please, we encourage everybody to continue those actions as we go through um, the holidays. We are still seeing um, some stress on our healthcare capacity. Um, you know, we've got um, over 1,300 confirmed COVID cases in the hospital right now. And when you look at folks in the ICU, that's over 300 confirmed cases in the ICU. And of those, more than 200 are on a ventilator. And that includes one child. So, um, you know, these increased numbers of cases that we're having translates into more hospitalizations, translates into more deaths. Um, and so I would encourage everybody to remain vigilant and continue to be serious about limiting transmission. But we do have a foot in the door with vaccine. And we've had vaccine in Mississippi now uh, for a couple of weeks. Um, and right now we are still in phase 1A. Just as a reminder, that's um, a targeted priority of vaccination for healthcare personnel in the state and for residents and staff at long-term care facilities. We have already distributed out a lot of vaccine um, in both of those efforts to hospitals, to long-term care facilities, um, to continue to target those um, those personnel. Um, and you know, moving forward, we want to continue to um, expand access and availability of um, the vaccine to those healthcare personnel. And when we think about the importance of healthcare personnel, these are the folks who have a high risk of exposure. So we wanna make sure that they're protected. These are the folks who um, are um, taking care of our sickest folks and our patients. So we wanna continue their capacity to stay on the job. And by vaccinating them and protecting them, we also prevent transmission from those individuals. So, like I said, in an effort to continue to expand the availability of this vaccine to all healthcare personnel in the state, we are announcing now that starting next week, we will have 
uh, vaccination clinics at 18 sites throughout Mississippi, targeting specifically any and all healthcare personnel. And this is a broad umbrella. We wanna make sure that we get those individuals who are in healthcare settings vaccinated. That includes folks like emergency medical services personnel, obviously nurses and doctors. Um, it includes dentists um, and any of those administrative and support staff that are working in hospital settings, in clinic settings, in healthcare settings. And this will be, this will continue to be important for us. I want to let y'all know that we have received um, and distributed almost 120,000 doses so far in Mississippi. And that includes doses that we're distributing to our drive-through 18 sites throughout the state. Um, that's more than 90% uh, or about 90% of the doses that we've been allocated so far. And remember, when we look at administration of vaccines, when we provide uh, these allocations to locations and settings throughout the state, when doctors, when hospitals administer this vaccine, they need to report it back into our immunization registry. And so far in our immunization registry in Mississippi, more than 17,000 individuals have been vaccinated with a first dose so far, and that represents those healthcare personnel and some long-term care uh, settings. So I, I'd like to turn it over to, to Mr. Craig to discuss how we're gonna roll out um, these, uh, these 18 clinics and the logistics behind that. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Byers, and, and thank you all for, for being with us a little bit this morning. I would like to share um, some of the information about these 18 sites. As Dr. Byer said, beginning Monday, uh, next week, January 4th, we'll be opening 18 clinical drive-through sites throughout the state. Now we're leveraging our existing testing infrastructure. If you're familiar with our drive-through testing, we provide in every county in the state of Mississippi, where uh, many Mississippians can come and receive free testing if they're symptomatic or if they're a contact to a confirmed case. And in some cases, uh, school teachers, uh, um, child care workers, first responders, and others that, that need to be tested can come to these locations. The drive-through model has worked really well. In fact, we're testing over 2,000 folks almost every day in Mississippi through those drive-through locations. Uh, we're leveraging 18 of those locations, some of the ones with the higher throughput, to be able to provide these uh, vaccination opportunities in a drive-through format for healthcare workers. Uh, I'm gonna share a map just so you'll be able to see where these locations are. And then I'll tell you a little bit more about, can, can everyone see that map, Dr. Byers? Yes, sir. All right, so you'll notice uh, these drive-through locations, the, the triangles in the, the county box are the locations in each of the geographic testing regions that we have. And we have nine of these geographic regions that we do testing uh, in. We've provided two sites, and, and in most cases, the high volume sites for these uh, vaccination efforts to, to continue. They're very much like we use the UMC as, as our partner to schedule testing. We will use UMC as a partner to schedule vaccinations. These sites require a, 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 an appointment, just like we do for uh, the, the testing components. So individuals need to go online and the website is covidvaccine.umc.edu. And there they will be able to register for an appointment at one of these 18 sites. For those that uh, like to look at information a little bit different, let me share a, another uh, presentation of the data. So here are the counties, the 18 counties that we'll be operating in and the days that we will be providing vaccination opportunities in those counties next week. Mr. Um, Craig, we can't see that. I oh, think we may have to stop sharing and share again. All right, let me do that right quick. All 
All right, can you see it now, sir? All right, so these are the 18 counties uh, listed out um, along with the dates of next week when we will be in those counties providing vaccination opportunities. Um, uh, and those are the ones that individuals will be able, healthcare workers that are eligible can, can schedule an appointment on any of these days in any of these sites, not just where they live they can, they can go to uh, areas where they work or, or, or other areas surrounding them. So uh, signing up is again at covidvaccine.umc.edu and we, we definitely want to thank our partners at the uh, University of Mississippi Medical Center for working with us in both the testing effort as well as the vaccination effort. At these sites, very similar to what you see in testing, there will be public health nurses to assist in the administration of the vaccine, as well as Mississippi National Guardsmen that were that are vaccinators. Uh, those particular vaccinators are some of our uh, combat medics from the Army National Guard, as well as medical personnel from uh, our Air Guard that will be assisting in the vaccination efforts at these locations. So with that, um, that's a little bit about the good news. Like Dr. Byer said, it's a, it's a light at the end of the tunnel, I believe, for, for many of us in this pandemic, this terrible pandemic that we've been in. So we're very, very happy that this uh, opportunity is available for healthcare workers, again, in 1A um, to, to receive this vaccination. With that, Liz, I'm gonna turn it over to you for some questions from the group and see if we can give them some answers. Okay, can you do me a favor, Mr. Craig, and get out of that? I can't. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so I think y'all have addressed some of this, but I'm just going to go ahead and read them. Um, Kingfish from the um, Jambalaya, Jackie Jambalaya, is asking about the 4,500 doses that the New York Times reported, which we know is not accurate. Did you not say that 17,000 uh, Dr. Byers have already been vaccinated with the first dose? Yeah, that's correct. And, and it's important to remember that, um, you know, there can be a delay in, um, in entering that data into our immunization registry from the, from the hospitals and the facilities that are out there doing the vaccination. And so there's going to be some inherent, inherent delays. Um, but it's also important to understand that that number is updating constantly as we get more entries of vaccinations administered into that system. And when we looked at where we were, um, this morning, uh, 17,410 uh, uh, vaccinations had been administered so far in Mississippi. Um, we are going to be putting that data up on our uh, website uh, later today. So I encourage everybody to look for that. It'll have some demographic information and have uh, the number of, of doses that have been reported administered on a, uh, on a weekly basis. And we anticipate that number to continue to grow uh, in the in the coming days to weeks. Okay, the next question is from Connor with the Enterprise Journal. Uh, have vaccines started arriving at nursing homes? What is the distribution schedule for those places around the state? So Dr. Byers, why don't you explain the pharmacy partnership and then talk a little bit about how the long-term care uh, residents and staff will get their vaccines. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a, a federal pharmacy partnership that we that we have um, with CVS at Walgreens and, and we have allocated um, doses um, to that program for both the nursing homes and that includes the nursing home residents and nursing home staff, but also um, other long-term care facilities in the state like assisted living centers and personal care homes to make sure that that vulnerable population that has been hit so hard during this pandemic is, is protected um, out of the gate. Um, we do understand that, that um, uh, some of those facilities have already started receiving um, the vaccinations. Um, we also know that um, many of them have been contacted to, by CVS and Walgreens to make arrangements for when their, their um, vaccinations will begin. And, and this was really going to roll out from, from the pharmacies um, with them making uh, two to three visits to, to each one of the long-term care facilities to make sure that they get that first dose in, um, to make sure that they, they come back in a little bit later to, to identify any other individuals who may have been admitted or have missed that first round, and then come back in later uh, to provide the booster dose or the second dose. And so obviously this is going to be a matter of weeks 
before um, this, this series of vaccinations in long-term care facilities gets completed, but we are excited that it started. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer with Bloomberg Live, I think we have answered your question about how many people have received the vaccine. Write me back if, if I'm misinterpreting that. All right, next is Ronnie from the Vicksburg Daily News. And I'm going to throw this to Mr. Jim Craig. Does phase 1A include first responders? Vicksburg firefighters and EMTs are receiving vaccines. So yes, thank you for that. Um, you know, it's important right now to know that we're in 1A providing vaccination. So the focus is healthcare workers, uh, as well as that long-term care community through the, uh, the partnership and, and also through our opportunity. You know, those long-term care employees that may not be able to receive the vaccine uh, right away, that want to make an appointment to come to one of the drive-through vaccination clinics are, are more than welcome to, to come there as well. But on the first responders, if, if you look at it, uh, it's, it's those individuals that will have uh, direct or indirect exposure to COVID patients or infectious materials. So um, EMS uh, certified emergency medical technicians and certified paramedics are definitely appropriate, but we should make sure that all of our vaccination efforts right now are focused on those critical health care and long-term care resources. Okay, so uh, we've already answered uh, exactly how many people have been vaccinated in Mississippi. The other question is, do you need federal support? Which one of you would like to take that on? Well, I, 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 can, I can start off and then uh, Mr. Craig can, can kind of jump in. And, and certainly, you know, one of the biggest pieces we've had with federal support is making sure that that vaccine is available and allocated to us so that we can, um, that we can distribute it out. And, and I can't uh, um, overestimate uh, or under, underestimate how, how important that's been. Uh, that's been huge for us. And, and this, is, this is really where we need to be going with that. Certainly, you know, we've also received um, federal funding to support our efforts. And, and I think as, as we roll out and we see the uptake increase, uh, I think that we're gonna be able to marshal the staff uh, along with our, our healthcare partners in the state who are also going to help us distribute and administer that vaccine out as we move through the phases. Uh, Mr. Craig? Yeah, I think you're exactly right, Dr. Byers. The, the, the support has been great. Um, and, and the biggest support we need is to continue to get vaccine into our state um, so that we can, we can continue these efforts around the state of Mississippi and, and enlarge the groups as, as we can. But it is so dependent on us receiving additional vaccine for us to be able to, to do more good in the state of Mississippi. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Um, has the Department of Health taken steps to trace those people who have received the two different types of vaccines? And will the Department of Health pursue them to make sure they take the follow-up vaccines? Dr. Byers, why don't you take this first? And then Jim Craig, you can kind of talk about the practicalities of that with the card at the, at the different sites and that kind of thing. So Dr. Byers, go ahead. No, so that, that's a great question. And that brings up a great point. So when an individual is vaccinated with the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine, it's important that they get the booster shot with the same vaccine. And, and the timing is different as well. So for the Pfizer vaccine, that booster shot, you need to get um, uh, 21 days later. Um, for the Moderna vaccine, it's 28 days later. So it's important to track that and remember that. So when people get vaccinated, when an individual gets vaccinated, they get a card um, that, that says exactly what kind of vaccine they've been given. Um, and we do have a system and certainly in our immunization registry, it tells us um, whether an individual received the Moderna vaccine or whether an individual received the, the Pfizer vaccine. And so it's important for people to hold on to that card, but there's also gonna be a system of um, reminders that will send a text message out to tell people, hey, it's time to get your vaccine. You need to make sure that you get it, um, really should get it at the same place where you got the first vaccine uh, to make sure that you get the, the same uh, vaccine for the booster dose. Uh, Mr. Craig? Yeah, it, the real important part is to remember that you need to get the same vaccine, the second dose that you received on the first dose. And, and when in the scheduling system, as people are looking to, to schedule that second appointment to come back and, and, and get the vaccine, it, it'll help guide them in the right direction. 
there'll be a number of reminders, as, as Dr. Byer said, everyone that gets the vaccination at the drive through locations will receive a card. It'll just be a, a, a little little card like one I got already. Um, so it, if if they that that will be their first step to know whether they're 21 days on the Pfizer or 28 days on the Moderna product. It can also register on CDC's website with vSafe, which is a uh, after vaccination health checker, but also has a reminder piece built into that that will remind them through text message and others ways to uh, how important it is for them to, to come in and, and, and get that vaccine, but also to help uh, CDC and the uh, community that's providing these vaccines have more information about the experience of folks that are receiving the vaccine. So it's, it's a good tool that's out there and available on the CDC website. At the health department, uh, some of our systems will also have some reminder pieces that'll be put out. So I think there'll be plenty of reminders that'll be made. It'll just be important, important for people to make those second appointments and get back in. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, Keisha with the Clarion Ledger is asking, do you feel it is a good idea for lawmakers to begin the legislative session next week, given the current level of cases? Do you have any recommendations out on how or when it might proceed safely? Dr. Byers, why don't you take this? Um, absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we're, in a, we're in a time right now where we all have to proceed with caution, I think, and, and we all have to, to take those measures and, and put them in place to try to limit transmission as best we can. There are things that we have to do. You know, Many of us have to go to work. Um, in the coming few weeks, we'll have people going back to school. We'll have individuals going back to colleges and universities. It's important for us to be mindful to make sure that we put in place those, those measures to prevent transmission, not only in the workplace, but in our, in our personal life and in our social life. And, and I think that you know, uh, over the, the last weeks to months, we've demonstrated that there can be some ways to, to accomplish things uh, safely by making sure that you're consistently wearing a mask, making sure that you're staying six feet away, um, limiting um, how many people that you're interacting with in a given time. And, and when you have folks in a, in a room, uh, like a large classroom or some other large room, you make sure that those, those folks are separated out by, by six feet. So, um, you know, uh, any activity that we do, anytime that we're, we're interacting with other people, there is always a risk of transmission. We have so much COVID out there right now that we all have to act as if the individual that we are interacting with at any given point in time is potentially infected and the, that we may be potentially infected. So we always have to, to take those measures in place. Uh, Jim? No, Doc, I think you covered it really well. Okay, so we have uh, Megan Watkins from NBC News. Is there a plan in place for releasing your data in the future? I can tell you yes, and it will be on our website, with the, which is healthyms.com slash COVID-19. Um, Stephen from WCBI, do you believe that the increased access to the vaccine can be used as an incentive as hospitals look to hire more nurses, healthcare workers, et cetera? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not real sure about that. I can, I can tell you right now um, that, that healthcare staff and, and, and nurses in particular um, are, are, are not in, in great supply. You know, we, we've, we've, uh, we are, are, are using um, all of the staff uh, available in hospital settings. Um, it would be great, however, if um, you know the the prospect of, of vaccination and that protection uh, that the vaccine could afford healthcare providers gives them a greater sense of security that they want to come back and work in those hospital and healthcare settings. I think that that would be great, uh, Jim. Yeah, I've, I've you know I've heard stories of especially a lot of the healthcare workers that are on the front line in these critical uh, critical care wards and the ICU wards of uh, hospitals and the COVID, COVID sections of hospitals that when they started receiving vaccine were, were, were just so happy to have that opportunity to have the vaccine. It's been a long battle for a, a lot of the healthcare workers. So I, I think it's, it's just great to know that it's, it's here for them. Okay, thanks guys. Sarah would like to have the website register. Oh, can you repeat the website? Yes, 
Um, and I put it yeah. in the chat. I was going to say covidvaccine.umc.edu. Jim, did you want to add something to that? I, I know. I just uh, wanted to let you know I put it in the chat so you can find it in the chat. Oh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Anita, will you be publicly reporting number of vaccinations given? The answer to that would be yes. And you will find that on our website. We're going to try to provide you as much information as often as we can. Um, Anna and Sna and Snaves. All right, with the Meridian Star. How far is Mississippi along the process of vaccinating long-term care residents? I think we talked a little bit about that. Which counties or parts of the state have started to receive vaccine at long-term care facilities? Do either of you guys want to add anything? Yeah, you know, we're just we're just getting started. So so you know, we we activated that system uh, back uh, uh, earlier in December um, in the week of. Uh, I think it was December 16th is when we activated uh, the first nursing home rollout. And it, you know, once we allocated doses to the to CVS and Walgreens, it takes them a couple of weeks to get started. So really, they're just now out getting started vaccinating those long-term care facility residents and, and staff. And you know, there's there's a delay, like I talked about. It takes it takes a little bit of time that once those doses are administered um, to, to to receive those into the immunization registry and get them entered. So you know, we're going to have more data on that as we go through. But let me just tell you that all of the nursing homes in Mississippi, all 204 throughout the state, are part of that program and all will be vaccinated with that program as we move forward. Okay. Um, Jim, did you have anything you want to add to that? Uh, the only thing I will say is that, you know, CVS and Walgreens both have uh, um, some information on their websites about the timeline in their vaccination efforts with the partnership. So the, that might be some good resources to look at if you're looking for some timelines. Thank you, that, that's very helpful. Okay, Kobe from MPB. What are your thoughts on the first reported US cases of the COVID-19 variant originally discovered in the UK, which we did talk about a little bit last week, showing up in Colorado, Dr. Byers? Well, I, I, I'm first going to tell you that it's not surprising. Um, you know, we anticipated that that um, it was going to be found in the United States, given the fact that um, it has become the predominant strain in the United Kingdom, and with given the travel uh, that that is extensive between these two countries, how long it may have been in the United States is is really unknown. But these are the first detections, and I anticipate that that additional. Uh, cases of this particular strain will be identified in the, in the coming in the coming weeks. Uh, we have not identified uh, one of these in Mississippi yet, but we do send uh, samples to CDC for for um, evaluation to determine what type of strain they are to make sure that they haven't had this uh, specific uh, mutation that identifies this UK strain. Um, you know, we're still early in the process. Uh, learning about this strain, and and I think you know more details will be revealed in the in the in the coming weeks. Um, I think the big question on everybody's mind is is um, will the vaccine cover this, or if I've been infected before, um, will I have an immunity to this particular strain? So far, you know um, the experts uh, have told us that they they um, anticipate that this will have little impact on the ability of the vaccine to be able to, to protect uh, from this strain. Um, I think those tests are ongoing and those studies are ongoing to look at that more closely. But right now we feel uh, relatively confident that um, the vaccine is going to cover that strain. Okay, thank you, Dr. Byers. Uh, Anita from the Sun-Herald, Dr. Dobbs said Mississippi will need 17 million for vaccination rollout. Do you expect funding soon? Has lack of funding caused an issue? So we've talked about this uh, a little bit. Jim, do you wanna take this? Sure, I can. Um, you know, a, a lot of that funding is is uh, federal and about 75% of it will, will come from the federal government. And, and, and that uh, is in large part through the Stafford Act. 
Uh, some of it is some grant funds to the state, but through the Stafford Act, which is a reimbursement program for a lot of our response activities. So uh, th that piece seems to be working very, very well. <clears throat> we continue to get that support from the federal government. The 25% piece, uh, the legislature is uh, aware of the, those requirements and they've been very supportive of our efforts as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Sierra from the New York Times. Uh, how many doses have been received by the state so far? I think you said, you guys have said that already. Let me look. Did you say, uh, let's see. Jim, so, you want to repeat that? Yeah, yeah. so we have we've, um, distributed um, about 120,000 doses okay. so far. And that, that represents um, about 90% of the doses that have been allocated to us. Um, and, yeah. and, you know, we're working on getting those other doses out the door, um, even as we speak. Yeah, our goal is always to get it out the door and in the arms of people and not waste any any doses whatsoever. Absolutely. Kate Fish from the Jackson Jambalaya, how many doses are given to the state veteran homes? If not, when? Now, don't they have their own program for the veteran homes? Jim? So uh, our state veterans homes are nursing facilities within the state. They're licensed by the health department as a nursing facility. So much like the other long-term care facilities, they're, uh, they're receiving their doses through the partnership. I believe for all, all four of our homes in Mississippi, their partner has been assigned as CVS. So CVS will be working with them to get their, uh, their, their doses administered. Thank you. Uh, Rogelio with the AP. And we've already talked about the legislature a little bit, but I want to repeat all questions unless there's, in case y'all have additional information. With the legislature beginning Tuesday, are there plans to inoculate the lawmakers and capital staff? Or will COVID testing be again offered to identify and eliminate those folks that might be COVID positive? A large minority of lawmakers are over 60, but not 75. So are they to wait until they are eligible? I would think the answer to that is yes, because our first priority is going to be healthcare workers, which are critical to our infrastructure and surviving COVID-19 and our long-term care facilities. But do you gentlemen have anything else to add? No, absolutely right. We recognize the vulnerability of individuals um, who have underlying medical problems or who are older, especially those folks over the age of 65, we know that they are at higher risk for severe outcomes right now. And, and certainly everybody is going to have a turn as we roll this out. And we're going to do that as quickly as we can. Uh, right now, today, the focus is on those healthcare workers in those long-term care settings. But as we move forward, we anticipate that we're going to be able to, to move to those people who are more, more vulnerable. And just remember that we do have a, a few legislators that are healthcare workers. So if you do hear of a legislator that, that, that receives vaccine, he, he may be a health, he or she may be a healthcare worker. Thank you guys. Okay, uh, Lauren is asking, there seems to be confusion over some basics of medical science. Can you explain in layman's terms how COVID can cause fatal problems outside of the lungs. For example, before the Louisiana Congressman died, the New York Post reported he had a heart attack after a procedure. Um, and yeah, I, I, can, I can talk a little bit about that. And, and so we know that um, uh, unlike flu, which is primarily a respiratory illness, um, COVID is, is not limited to just the respiratory system. It can affect and um, uh, impact any organ system and can have an impact on the kidneys, on the heart. Um, and, and a lot of times the, because of that, um, it can lead to complications that, that can um, require hospitalization and sometimes lead to death. And so, you know, this is one of the reasons why those people who, who have those underlying chronic medical problems like um, diabetes that can affect many organ systems already and can already cause some organ damage um, or heart disease that can impact the heart. Um, this is one of the reasons those, those folks are, are at higher risk for these severe outcomes. So, you know, I, I think it's just another illustration. COVID is not the flu. And, and for folks who say that, that this is just a, a bad case of the flu, it's not. It can impact any organ system in our body and can lead to complications and death. Okay, 
Okay, thank you. Um, is there a breakdown of total doses expected to be available at sites next week in North Mississippi counties, DeSoto, Lee, Panola, and Lafayette? Mr. Craig, we did talk about this yesterday. So how, what is the allotment? Is it the same in all the counties? Yeah, so it is the same uh, for, for each of the counties. Again, these are some of our high throughput locations. So we will have uh, 210 appointments available each of those days that I showed at each of those locations. So uh, for Lee County, in, in, in other words, there'll be 210 uh, appointments available on uh, the two days, each day uh, of the two days next week. Thank you. And did you mention we expect appointments to take about 10 minutes, Jim? Well, I want I want to I want to temper expectations a little bit. I, I don't know that the, it'll be a ten minute appointment. Um, you know, we're doing about ten people uh, at a time in the drive through coming through. Um, the process is about ten minutes from when you enter the process and then leave the process. Other than when you get through with the vaccination, um, you're we, we want we want to monitor for uh, medical. Uh, side effects that might occur um, in a, a, a the lot. We will have a lot that people will pull into for 15 minutes, and and that way, if there are, are any adverse reactions, we can monitor and assist those individuals. Thank you so much. All right, Kingfish from the Jackson Jambalaya. Good question. What about elderly who cannot make it to vaccination sites? Jim Craig. So the current plan right now is to, to work through the, the vaccination sites. That's the good news for right now. We do understand that a lot of our partners, whether they're in uh, fairly qualified health centers or other, other places where people normally get health care, uh, as more vaccine is available, we'll have more opportunities available. Okay. Dr. Byers, did you want to add anything? No, I, I think Mr. Craig covered it completely. Okay. Kobe with MPB asking on behalf of someone I interviewed this month, when might morticians and or funeral home employees qualify for the vaccine as that career has crossover with first responders and the medical field? Uh, Jim Craig? So, uh, you know, it, it's not clearly defined yet exactly what 1B and 1C is going to be fully um, uh, inclusive of. But right now, the priority is healthcare workers, those essential healthcare workers, and the long-term care facilities. The rest of it, you know, we'll 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 make other announcements as we know a little bit more. But they're they're very important. We want everybody, all the essential workers, to get the vaccination uh, when they can. But we do have to, with the limited supply, we'll, we'll have to figure out some priorities within these groups. And and not knowing what that supply is is limiting what some of that conversation is right now. And, and I just want to throw out a little bit of perspective too. I mean, when you when you look at the estimations for for the number of healthcare workers that we or healthcare personnel that we have in the state, in, inclusive of those emergency medical services, we're looking at, at about two hundred thousand folks in the state that that would qualify as healthcare personnel. When you add um, the additional long term care residents and long term care staff. Uh, you know, that adds another another um, uh, 60,000 folks. So, you know, we're looking at 260,000 initial doses um, to, to get healthcare workers vaccinated in the state. We're looking at, at potentially half a million doses or more to get um, every healthcare personnel vaccinated in the state with, with two doses. And so far, we, we've been able to distribute out about 120,000 doses. So you can see that we still have a, a process to go through as, as we work through the phases. And, and we wanna make sure that we, we get as many people in each phase protected as we move through. Yeah, that, that's very helpful. All right, I think we need to clarify this. Any challenges out there of why 17,000 doses were administered out of the 120,000 distributed so far. So in that 120,000, that also includes our sites. These are allocations. Uh, Jim, do you want to take that on? Well, and I think it also includes uh, what we've allocated to long-term care facilities uh, right. has to come out of that. And as Dr. Byer said, you know, that's 60, 70,000 folks that are the uh, health care workers in our long-term care facilities, as well as those residents. Yes, thank you. Uh, Rogelio, um, how long after either vaccine 
does a person have before absolutely needing the second dose? You guys had said Pfizer 21 days, Moderna 28 days. Some people might be involved with work that prevents them from taking the necessary break to receive the second dose. Dr. Byers? No, there, there's some good news with that. And, and that is the, 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 the minimum time frame between those vaccinations needs to be 21 and 28 days. But if you go over the 21 or go over the 28 days, um, you still need to get vaccinated. Thank you. Um, okay, Gerald with 12 News. What are the safeguards against people who pretend to be healthcare workers trying to get vaccinated? We would hope people would identify, honestly, we need to get that group first. Uh, Jim Craig. Yeah, a lot of uh, healthcare workers uh, as a profession, they're either licensed or certified individuals uh, or at minimum, they'll have a, a healthcare facility related uh, ID. So those will be the types of things that we'll, we'll, we'll use to, to verify that individuals that are licensed, certified, healthcare workers that uh, should be at, at our facilities for, for vaccination are there. But as, as uh, as Liz said, you know, we're hopeful that everyone understands the importance of healthcare workers right now getting this vaccine. Thank you. Dr. Byers, did you want to add anything to that? No, and, and, and you know, uh, we encourage folks to, to, especially the healthcare workers, and I know that we get a lot of questions from, from healthcare personnel uh, about, um, you know, when is it our turn? Well, this is the opportunity, and we want to make sure that those healthcare workers um, have the opportunity to, to come and get vaccinated and know that they can, they can sign in and get an appointment at, at our vaccine clinics and they can get in and out and, and receive the vaccine that they need that, uh, that really we've been wanting them to get for quite some time. Okay. Sierra, will there be a way to rewatch this? Yes, we post all of our press conferences online under news and events. Uh, once they are rendered. If you could please repeat how many doses have been received to the state and how many have been administered? Did you guys say 120,000? 100, right, 120,000 have been distributed out in the state. Um, over 17,000 have been administered and that's reported administered in our immunization registry. Right, okay. So that number at times may be a little bit underreported. It most um, likely is, yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. Um, Kingfish, with the emphasis on healthcare workers, how many healthcare workers have contracted the virus and how many have died? Do we know that off the top of our heads? You know, I don't, I don't have that number right off the top of my head, but I can tell you that we have had several thousand healthcare workers um, that have been infected in the state and, and a number of them have died. But um, you know, where we see um, a lot of our transmission early on in, in the pandemic as, as we learned more about how this virus was transmitted, we did see some impact on healthcare workers becoming infected in, in the setting of providing that care. As we've, we've done better with our personal protective equipment and we've had broader availability and we've learned more about the appropriate isolation and management of patients, we've seen that that, that um, infections in healthcare workers is, is less um, uh, than it was earlier on, but there's still a risk. There's still a risk that they could be um, exposed to those individuals in the, in the normal course of their work. And there's still a risk that if a healthcare worker becomes infected, even if they're not infected in the workplace, even if they're not health infected in the healthcare setting, that they could transmit that to the patients that they're trying to take care of. And I think that's really illustrates one of the important reasons why we want to continue to focus on these healthcare workers right now. Thank you, Dr. Byers. Uh, any goals of total amount vaccinated in Mississippi by end of January, end of spring? I think that's kind of a tough because it depends on so many variables. Um, Dr. Byers, why don't you take it first? Uh, I think it, it does depend on it. And, it. and a lot of it's gonna depend on the uptake. And I think that you know we're gonna have a much better idea of what the uptake is gonna be and what the demand for vaccination is gonna be in the healthcare community next week. 
So stay tuned on that. Yeah, the only thing I'd add is, you know, as a goal, I would love to see the opportunity for every healthcare worker in Mississippi uh, to have that opportunity to get the COVID vaccine uh, during the month of January. But yeah. again, as you said, it is dependent on how much vaccine we receive. Right, it's a very fluid situation. Um, okay, so I am gonna ask you, I don't see any more questions at this point. Uh, Mr. Jim Craig, can you make some closing comments? Sure. Um, you know, I, I would definitely like to thank our, our partners. You know, the Mississippi National Guard has been just, just, just wonderful in our testing, as, and, and we look forward to the same thing in this vaccination effort, and our partner at UMMC in, in developing the, the websites for both scheduling of testing and the scheduling of, of vaccine. Um, I'd also like to remind everybody that gets the vaccine that they, they need to continue to do those things that Dr. Fire spoke to earlier. Follow all the current guidance, even after they've been vaccinated, to protect themselves as well as others. Uh, and those are the simple things that Dr. Dobbs and everyone's been saying all along. Uh, wear the mask, staying at least six feet away from others, avoiding those crowds, a good hand hygiene, washing those hands often, uh, following the uh, quarantine guidance. If you have an exposure to someone with COVID-19 and following any applicable workplace or school guidance that may be out there as well. And thank you, Liz. Okay, Dr. Byers. Yeah, thank you, Liz, and, and thank you, Mr. Craig. And, and I just want to remind everybody again that we are not out of the woods. We're talking about exciting stuff now. We're talking about vaccines. And we do have a light at the end of the tunnel. But, um, you know, given the amount of doses that we have to distribute and the amount of people that we need to vaccinate, um, this is going to be a process that, that um, you know, we've got a light at the end of the tunnel, but it's still a long tunnel. Um, and, you know, we, we don't want to um, miss the fact that today we're reporting out over 3,000 cases. And yesterday we reported out 85 deaths. Um, the vaccine is exciting and we're glad to have it. And this is a step in the right direction for us as we move forward. But guys, we are not out of the woods. We are in, in still the worst time that we have seen so far in this pandemic. And we are not seeing any signs really that, that things are slowing down. And we are still in the middle of the holidays. I would encourage everybody, please, for, for, for New Year's, keep it small, keep it nuclear, um, avoid those social gatherings. Um, make sure that you're wearing a mask when you're out doing your essential, your essential activities. Um, please, for the, for, the, for the good of folks, and you know, we know that, um, Every case can translate into hospitalization. It can translate into deaths. We want to try to limit that uh, while we are waiting for the vaccine to continue to roll out. We have some opportunities to, to still work on reducing transmission with those things that we know have worked in the past. Thank you. I did want to say one thing to the media. We have enjoyed great relationships with all of you and you all do a great job getting the information out to the public. I had an unfortunate incident on Monday where uh, a reporter went into the county health department and took pictures, which is highly prohibited. You can get, as we do testing and as we do these vaccinations, you can get wide shots standing off the property. Um, if you find folks as they're driving away that wanna to talk to you, that's fine, but, but we do not allow reporters on the premises or anywhere where, where we are providing vaccinations and definitely you can't take pictures and this is because of HIPAA. This was a very young inexperienced reporter. So I know that that wouldn't have happened with you all who are on the call, but I just want to thank you for your cooperation always and we'll try to help you any way we can. And with that, I'm going to say happy new year to everyone and have a great day. Thank y'all. Yeah, thank y'all.